ecosystem for the first time in uh, 2017. Uh, I was a Marine infantry officer, Afghanistan, Japan, and the Philippines. Before that, I was a three-time national boxing champion, two-time most valuable boxer, captain my boxing team at the United States Naval Academy. And when I transitioned from the military, I started a free boxing gym in Newark, New Jersey called Ironbound Boxing, hence the swag. And uh, that's how I became an entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, I wanted to fund a free program for kids and uh, never really considered myself an entrepreneur. I was just a guy with a problem. And it took me on this journey uh, from Stanford Ignite was one of the first programs I did to Bunker Labs to uh, eventually um, all kind of stuff. I've been through the ringer. I'm like Muhammad Ali, job been broke, been knocked down, but I'm bad. Right. And I'm here to share the lessons so that you all can uh, be bad, too. All right. So this is my I'm important slide, but it ain't about me today. It's about you all. All right. Now, this is something nobody told me when I became an entrepreneur. Right. What does that road ahead actually look like for many of you? All right. So think back to the early days. I'm going to pick on my man, Dave, because him and I were chopping it up when we first entered. You're like, I got this idea. Right. And we're like, oh, yeah, man, we're going to do this bookstore. We're all excited. We're all energized. It's amazing. But you know what nobody tells us, right? What happens after that year one, year two, year three, that grind? You're not sleeping. You know what I'm saying? You're putting on some weight. I'm not you, Dave. I'm talking about me, right? But uh, you start putting on some weight, whatever. But that's what you're getting into, right? It's all nice and games. Come with an idea. We're all high five and slapping each other, telling each other how amazing it is. But, man, when you're in it, you're in it. And the difference between business and entrepreneurship and what a lot of us were used to in the military, this deployment doesn't end. This ain't no six-month sprint, you know? I know some of you Army people, you only done 13 months, whatever. Ain't got none on entrepreneurship. I've been shot at, mortared, the whole nine yards. Nothing has challenged me to my core like what I've dealt with as an entrepreneur, both managing people, and then you think about the crises we've been through with the pandemic and everything else, all right? So this stuff is real. All right. But there's a path forward. All right. And that path forward is the five stages of small business growth. All right. So stage one, you validate your business idea. This means you get paying customers, not grandma who tells you, oh, yeah, baby, that sounds like a good idea. Right. Or your friends that try to talk you up. Right. No, paying customers. If somebody says it's a good idea, charge them on the spot because we need to validate that there's a market need and that people are willing to pay us. The two reasons. Businesses fail, primary reasons. Number one, no market need. So there's no demand for their products or services. And number two, they run out of cash, right? And you can still be a good entrepreneur and still run out of cash. I just want to prevent that early on. So we got to validate that business model. And typically that's money in the bank account, right? 10 paying customers, 100 paying customers, whatever. You just need to feel comfortable that, hey, I validate the business model. From there, the next step is, all right, we validated it. Now we need to get predictable revenue coming in month over month because this is where you're going to be able to start planning your own compensation, right? You're also going to, maybe you have a team or something, but you don't want to jump the gun on this. You want to drive sales, right? You want to get predictable sales, all right? So since I run an agency, it's a little different for me, right? I'm not going month over month. I go more for the year. I need to earn a certain amount of revenue for the year because I keep a lot of cash on hand, all right? Now, for some of you that are selling product-based businesses, it might be a little bit difficult. Why? Because your margins are going to be a lot tighter, okay? So you got to drive that revenue. You need to know, without a doubt, I'm bringing in $1,500 a month, month over month. Because, see, now we can start having a little strategy, right? You say $5,000, and then $10,000. And you say, okay, what is my number? How much do you need to feel comfortable so you start paying yourself, all right? So then do sales. Right. So now we got that predictable revenue. And let's say you're still barely paying yourself. Right. But you've got you can make a little bit of strategic decisions. You're like, OK, I need to hire myself a virtual assistant. I need to hire that program manager. I need to bring in a team member. That's where you start to build the foundation of your business. OK, so this is where you're scaling up. Everybody hears the term scaling up. Right. They're like, oh, yeah, we need to scale. We need to scale. Do not rush it, especially if you're bootstrapping. Right. I'm going to say it again. Do not rush scaling if you are a bootstrap entrepreneur. There's a lot of companies, these tech startups, these venture backable startups, they got a lot of cash to burn. So they're not chasing profitability. They're foregoing profitability because they're trying to increase the valuation of their business. For us, that's not the case. Right. So you want to chase uh, revenue. Then you want to gradually start to build out your team. All right. So now you got your team. 
let's say it's like five of y'all, right? You're baking cookies out of your home, right? You probably have some part-time people helping you sell it. Maybe you have a virtual assistant on the back end and you say, okay, I'm ready to start stepping it up. I've been out of my home. Now I want to go to a commercial kitchen or something. Boom, that's that expansion. But guess what? As you expand, you're kind of going through this process all over again because now you need to validate that expansion, right? Does it make sense? Maybe you set up a location. Maybe you say, I'm ready to play in the big leagues and I want to have a brick and mortar store of my own, not some commercial kitchen. That's that expansion. And then the final phase, that multiply, that's where we talk about scale, right? So that's where you're going from two to three locations and stuff, et cetera. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, screenshot this slide. I'll send it to you afterwards, but five stages of small business growth. And as you're making decisions in your business, you might have to bounce around this phase. There's a lot of people right now that are facing cash crunch situations. So I'm also a professional business coach. And I was on with a, a, a client yesterday who is doing very well, but they've got really, really bad uh, cash flow going on to the point where like they could be out of business. If they hadn't raised um, some emergency capital, they would have had to close shop in April, mid-April. That's how much runway they had. So when people talk about runway, that's how long can they actually operate the business, right? If they don't bring in any more. So guess where he has to go back to? Yeah, he's got this great team foundation. We're back to sales. You know, every account receivable, let's track down some money. We're going to figure it out, right? Any money on the, on the field of play, we need to go and get it, all right? Or maybe they introduce a new product offering. See, now we go back to validate. So this is a fluid thing, but you're going to be able to assess where you are in your business, right, based off of this graph. All right. Now, what's the common problem people come up to me with? We need more customers, right? I need more customers. I need more customers. No, what you need are better customers. We need more profitable customers. We need the customers that pay us a premium for our products or services, tell everyone how amazing we are, right? Send us a constant stream of warm referrals. And the best part of all, they actually make us enjoy being an entrepreneur. We don't want customers that are paying in the ass. Y'all know who I'm talking about. The guy that comes in the bookstore, never buys anything, right? But ask, ask everybody questions. This and that. Maybe he rips the pages or something, right? Um, or those customers that like our heart sinks every time they call us. They give us anxiety, right? We don't want those. We want perfect customer. And so what you have to do is you have to position yourself to serve a perfect customer, right? And you're going to craft that. And really, the thing is, this is all a test, right? It goes back to what we learned in high school, the scientific method. It's a thesis, right? Who do we think our perfect customer is, right? I have assumptions about my perfect customer, which typically are veteran-led brands, generate a million dollars plus in revenue that are interested in launching a podcast and want to work with someone that they trust, okay? But on the other side of the house, I got civilians that are non-veterans that pay their invoices up front 100% in full, right? So part of it is looking and saying, okay, who, where are we, you know, where are we getting the most um, traction from? Craft your perfect customer, all right? Then what you're going to do is you need to create a whistle to communicate with them. So many of you guys are, are we on TikTok? Are we on Instagram? We need to be on Snapchat. Some new social media platforms come around, right? Where do you need to be? Well, I says it depends. And what does it depend on? Who your perfect customer is. If you're doing business with Fortune 100 CEOs, trying to do a TikTok video ain't the way to go, right? These people are probably on LinkedIn. They're probably a part of associations, professional associations that you have to pay to be a member of, uh, professional journals and whatnot. That's their whistle, okay? So where is your, car? what's a whistle that every time you blow on it, their ears perk up and they come running. They come asking questions, okay? Um, and so for you, right, when we're trying to say, okay, what is a good whistle? For me, I love podcasts, right? Because podcasting is easy for me. I believe that audio is the future of publishing. I really enjoy podcasting, right? But also our newsletter works really well and post it on LinkedIn. Like I'm not on Instagram and I'm on all these other things, right? I have kids posting there for us, but in terms of driving donations and whatnot, that's not the case. My preferred whistle is podcast. And for those that are vets, I like to think main effort, right? So what's that main effort, right? If it's newsletter, if it's dialing for dollars, which a lot of y'all might have to do early on to build traction, that's the main effort. And then you got supporting effort number one, which can be a podcast and a newsletter. And then supporting effort number two, which can be a podcast, newsletter, and maybe it's a free workshop. Okay. 
Then the last thing we got is branding. Okay. And you need to brand, you need to build a brand around an audience that you are uniquely positioned to serve. Right. So uh, when you see a brand, I like to use the example of liquid death. Y'all seen those tall boys can water, right? It's like, well, who the heck would drink that? Turns out when he launched that brand, the guy, Mike Cicero, is a punk rocker from like the West Coast, right? And he grew up heavily in the punk rock community. And in that community is known notorious with drugs and alcohol and a lot of bad stuff, right? But you do have people that are trying to do better, right? They want to get off the drugs. They want to be live a healthier life, okay? So introduce canned water, okay? Now, water was very boring for the most part. You see boring as plastic bottles and whatnot. But then you got this tall boy, right? With murder your thirst, right? So you got the hard punk graphics, et cetera, targeting a specific demographic that's trying to lay off the drugs and alcohol. So now those punk rockers, guess what? They're going to shows and concerts or they're hanging out afterwards and they're holding a tall boy and they still feel cool, right? So they can blend in. And so when he was going to market, where was he spending a lot of his time? Punk rock concerts, right? Where was he sending his product? These punk rock events, punk rock podcasts and stuff, et cetera. That's who the brand initially targeted. Now with since grown, right? So they're doing the Travis Scott's of the world and hip hop and yada, yada, yada. But you can't serve everyone. You ain't got enough time and energy. Build a brand around an audience. And then you're going to, you know what you're going to do? You're going to climb to the mountaintop. You're going to put your brand on a flag. And you're going to dig it in the ground. And you're going to say, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is what differentiates us from everyone else out there. And you're going to own it. And then you got to lean in, right? And I call that dog whistle branding, okay? So you need three things to build a dog whistle brand. Number one, you need a perfect customer. Someone willing to pay you a premium for your products or services. Tell everyone how amazing you are. Make a constant stream of warm referrals on your behalf. And they're not a pain in the ass. If they're a pain in the ass, they're not your perfect customer. Number two, you need a whistle to communicate with them. Every time you blow on your brand, drop in a post on social, send a new newsletter, you're blowing on a whistle. Just make sure you're communicating to the right person. And number three, you need a premium brand that says, take my money. All right, Mike, I hear you, but I'm overwhelmed. I got so much stuff to do. I got a man in the store. I got to bake cookies. It's just too much. Da, da, da. You're going to create a fire plan. All right. That perfect customer, a perfect customer of one is a perfect customer of 10 because they all hang out together. They congregate. Right. So what I want you to do is I want you to create a list of 10 names that match the profile of your perfect customer. We're going to 10. Always go back to 10. When you're overwhelmed, go back to 10. See this whiteboard up here? I got CRM. I got all that stuff. But damn, when it comes time to pulling money across the line, you know what I do? Put it on the whiteboard, right? Because that makes me hyper-focused. And it's funny, right? When we first start our businesses as entrepreneurs, you know, we do anything to get those first clients. Right, I'll come to you. You know, we really, really work it, right? We, we make sure we're top of mind. Then what happens, right? We get caught up in the day-to-day. -day, we're hustling. We're putting out fires. And now we're not spending as much time trying to get those customers across the line, those profitable customers. And the reason I like creating a fire plan of 10 is it keeps that focus, right? And you put those names on the board and you cross them out. You cross them out, all right? So always go back to this, right? That's 10. You can do the same thing for 100. Right. You're going to do the same thing for a thousand. The thing is, though, as you get better at it, right, you're going to be able to build a system around it. Right. So you ask yourself these questions. What needs to get done? So what, what is the what? And then do we have a process for it? Better yet, who needs to take ownership? And is there a process? So like I have a uh, her name is Erica. She's absolutely amazing. She's my head of growth. Right. And Erica helps me with all the lead gen activities. I'm still heavily involved. Right. But if say, hey, Mike is not going to do any lead gen. He's going to go shake hands and kiss babies all day. And somebody else is going to do all the selling. Right. I need to have a name for who's taking over. And she needs to have a process. And this is the thing about entrepreneurship, man. It's some of you, a lot of y'all are going to feel like you're making it up and you are. But guess what? That's what being an entrepreneur is. Right. Because you're operating at the edge of your own competency. Like it's one thing to have a job where you come in day to day. Everything's predictable. But for us, we're literally making the sausage. OK, so what you want to do is you want to cast a vision for your team that helps them build the train track ahead of you. So like the train's coming down the track. This is you by yourself right now, but it's going to get to the point to where they're they're building it. Right. So if you feel like you're making up, you're fine. 
I'm, before I open the floor for questions, I'm going to talk about a strategy of mine that is going to be super helpful for a lot of you. What is this on the screen? Tamara. Trojan horse. Trojan horse. All right. So when you see this, as it relates to business, I'm going to pick on you, Dave. What do you, why do you think I have a Trojan horse on here? Because you're sneaking in there, uh, unassuming. You're giving them a gift, but uh, there's something else uh, attached to it. Close. Let me use this analogy, all right? I'm Lance Corporal Smuckatelli, right? Lance Corporal Smuckatelli gets out the Marine Corps. Um, he had lieutenants. He had Captain Stedman as his platoon commander, so he learned how to read and write and do all great stuff, right? But then Smuckatelli says, I want to start a digital marketing agency. And he moves back to his hometown of Newark, New Jersey. And he starts his agency out of his one-bedroom apartment, okay? So then people say, Oh, Smuckatelli, what's going on? He's like, hey, I'm about to start this business. I'm going to do some digital marketing. And they say, you know what? You should reach out to Prudential. You should reach out to PSENG. You should reach out to Facebook and Google and all these different places. And you know what Smuckatelli feels like? He's setting up for failure. He's like, I don't know anybody there. That sounds great. These sound like great names. But realistically, if it's Smuckatelli's first client, does he really want to get Prudential, right? He's never onboarded. He's never sent an invoice. He's never done. Uh, he's never had to manage an account, right? He's setting himself up for failure. Insert the secret. Aha, the Trojan horse. You know what's a lot easier to do? Work with someone who already has that account as a value add, right? So in that case, what would it look like? Guess what? Maybe some local agency already has a Prudential as a client. But what they don't have is digital marketing services. And so they say, hey, Smuckatelli, guess what? We would love for you to work with us. We're, we're going to pay you 50% or 60%, right? So you're going to take less margin than you get from the whole contract. But guess what you get? OJT, on-the-job training. So not only is Smuckatelli building his confidence up by working with such a high-profile client, right? He's getting the reps in, and he's building rapport with the Prudential team. So then at a certain point, Maybe he uses that as a reputation. He could choose a little website and guess what he lists as one of his clients? Prudential, right? And so then guess who sees that? Amazon or something. And they're like, oh, you did work with Prudential? We would love to work with you. So it gives you a little bit of credibility. You have to have an abundance mindset with this thing, right? There's layers to the game, right? It's great we want to go out there and hit a home run right out the gate. But on nine, nine times out of 10, that doesn't happen. We have to learn and grow as, our, grow as entrepreneurs ourselves. We have to get the reps in. And one great way to do that is potentially finding a Trojan horse. So a Trojan horse is really just a channel partner, someone that you can work with. It'll probably take less. You're going to take less margin than you would if you did it on your own, but it's going to give you the experience and the reps you need. When I started Ironbound Boxing uh, in 2018, I left my full-time job to stand up a for-profit arm of Ironbound Boxing, teaching boxing to companies in the New York City metro area. Sound like a good idea. A terrible idea because I didn't validate the business model when I quit my job. So I was just uh I was falling out of the airplane trying to build my parachute on the way down. I had never taught boxing in a corporate setting before. Now I'm very confident in my skills because like I know amateur boxing like the back of my hand, but I had never walked inside a building on World Trade Center, swiped my little key card, you know what I'm saying? Gone up. I had never done that before. Thankfully, I got a channel partner by the name of Exuberancy which provides wellness services to clients all over New York City. And guess what one of their clients were? Spotify, Etsy, all these different ones, right? But it came at a cost. I taught boxing at Spotify at their World Trade Center headquarters for like a year and a half. I got paid $100 per class. Not a lot of money to brag about, right? But guess what? That Spotify logo was up on the website. So was that Etsy logo, right? So was that eBay logo. And guess what? Those $100 classes, allowed me to get $250 classes, which allowed me to get $1,000 classes, right? So you're not lying. You're telling the truth, right? But guess what, man? These people have no idea, right? You just need to be confident. And you be you don't need confidence. You need conviction because it's two different things. Confidence is like, yeah, I believe in myself. Da, da, da. Conviction is like, I know this like the back of my hand. Like I can do it like brush my teeth every morning, right? I don't even have to think about it. Right. I know for a fact because I've been through the ringer. So that's what I want you all to have. All right, I've been talking for like 20 minutes at this point. So now I want to go ahead and open up for questions. And let's do this. 
let's triage some for the group right here because we can do some live coaching here, right? Let's start based off of everything I've gone over, all right? Let's ask questions while also addressing specific issues you're facing in your business right now. So let's think through that together as a group. Who wants to go first? Not everyone at once. Hey, my name is Obi. What's up, Obi? How are you? Um, afternoon, everyone. Mike, Vince, I see you out there. Um, ex dog tag fellow as well, Army vet. Um, I'm on the second iteration or second lap of my business, right? I'm trying to get in the government contracting space. Um, a question that was, or a question that I'm trying to get an answer to is right. The services I think I want to provide, who is, and so you, you, you spoke on this, right? How do I, does anyone have any suggestion as to tracking down what agency or yeah, what, yeah, what agency is willing to, or what agency wants to work with my services? Does that, I hope that makes sense. All right. It does. So you're saying you want to do a government contracting. Correct. You're looking for existing government contractors. Uh, no, well, I either, I either want to be a subcontractor or what, how do I find out what agencies are willing to work with what services I have to offer? And I still haven't defined what services I want to offer yet. But. All right. So we, we didn't get into this, right? This is good. This is a good question. There's a book by a guy named Dr. Noon M. Campos called The Myth of the Idea and the Upside Down Startup. You don't have to read it. I already read it, right? But it goes like this, okay? Remember back in the day, they used to word, use this word speculation, right? They're like, oh, man, crypto is a new thing. Right. They're like, oh, we need to all invest in crypto. And then, you know, you have drinks with someone. You're like, what the hell you know about crypto? Well, you know, I saw somebody post on Instagram. It's like, yo, have you ever worked on the blockchain before? Right. Do you know anything about coding? Have you ever worked in finance? No. But, you know, my cousin, bro, you set up for failure from the very beginning, as opposed to leading with a reason. That's speculation. Right. That's the idea. Right. Everything is around the idea. But let's go on this side of the house. OK. Let's look and say, okay, what deep industry expertise do I already have that I already know? Okay. Know it like the back of my hand because I've been doing it so long and I have a reputation doing it. Then I say, okay, what social networks am I a part of? So I look at my existing social networks, right? Then I say to myself, okay, realistically, how much time can I dedicate to this thing? Right. Is it five hours a week? You know, is it 40 hours a week, whatever? And then I go all the way over. And then I find an idea. See what I'm saying? So we start over here and then we work over here to an idea that makes sense. So how does this apply to your question? What deep domain industry expertise do you already have? Do you know like the back of your hand? What networks are you already a part of? Because people do business with those they know, like, and trust. Business is like war. It's Game of Thrones. It's House Targaryen over here, right? We're all House Targaryen, right? So why do people have a reason to already trust you? That is not a hard sell, okay? How much time can you spend trying to do this outreach to connect with these people? And then say, okay, what is the best service that we can go after? Thank you for that. Next question. Did, 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 was, that a good, was that a good answer for you? Uh, yeah, 100%. It's, I mean, from what I heard, it sounds like reach out to my network, do my homework, right? And then those two things simultaneously would then tighten my shop group for me to, yeah. you know, execute. Thank you. Yeah. Do not do business with people you don't trust. There needs to be a vetting process. Somebody needs to say, man, it's a good person, you know, a referral or something. Cause you will get in all kinds of trouble because you haven't seen their work product. Right. They can be like, yeah, you know, I'm duh, 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 duh. but if you don't got anybody vouching for them, whatever, you could find yourself in a bad position. Hey, Mike. Just real quick, I do uh, some government contracts with the uh, Department of Corrections, selling books to DCFS, do a lot of state contracts. Uh, logistically, just make a list of municipalities, uh, state, local, fed, and it's okay to cold contact them. That's how I've done it. Just reach out to their business office. But the most important thing is to know what you're trying to sell first and then reach out to whoever their, their business admin person is and introduce introduce yourself and say, Hey, I'm a local. Uh, they like going with people that are close by first, because if something goes wrong and you're right there. Awesome. Thank advice. you for that. All right. Who's next? Who's got another question? 
Come on, y'all alumni, y'all in the trenches. Let's go. We got all these smart people, you know. I'm assuming everybody on this call's time is worth ten thousand dollars a minute. So I know mine is. So let's go. What what questions we got? Hey, Mike. I'm Mike Gephardt. You mentioned um, abundance mindset. Can you go into that a little bit, please? All right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mike, so say me and you um, are going to start a business, right? Or I say, oh, you know what? Me and you are going to partner together on a project or something, right? I will believe that there's enough money out there for both of us to eat, right? As opposed to coming with a scarcity mindset of like, oh, my God, there's only so much, da 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 da, da you know? And so sometimes what that means, too, is let's say on one of these contracts, it's like you're going to get 60%. I might get 40%. I'm like, all right, cool. We're going to make it up on the back end. I'm confident that if we go down this path, we are going to be successful. But the problem is when people in business, they have a scarcity mindset, right? They want to pay people pennies on the dollar, right? They don't want to. Um, uh, it's this feeling of, too, it's like now's the right time. You know, I, if you see all around boxing, I've been on Fox News, uh, freaking all these media profiles, all yada, yada, yada. How many of those have put money in my actual bank account? Very little. All right. But I remember when I was early on, I was like, this is the one, you know, this is going to be that interview that changes everything. Oh, my God, my whole world is going to, you know, it never happens. Right. Um, and so say you pass down that opportunity. They're like, oh, you know, we want to feature your business tomorrow. We're going to get you on. Da -da 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 -da. And then you say you can't do it because you got other obligations or something. And everyone around you is like, oh, my gosh, this could be the chance. Da -da -da. You have an abundance mindset. We're going to win. There's going to be more opportunities out there. If it came once, it's going to come again. Right. That's what I talk about with an abundance mindset. So an abundance mindset is not getting pressed, not allowing yourself to get to put in those positions where you have this weight over you. Because, like, let's say you have a business partner and things don't work out well, then it becomes toxic and all this other stuff. You know, maybe your time and energy ain't worth it. So you just walk away. You know, hey, you're good. We're all good. You know, I'm just going to walk away clear. Because you know what? You say, hey, this business might have not worked out. But even if I let them keep this equity or whatever else, I'm about to go make it over here instead of being tied down. So it's just there's enough out there for us to eat and having that mindset. Thanks. That answer your good. question? Yeah. You'll feel it. Can anybody raise your hand if you can relate with an abundance mindset? Especially when you're in a cash crunch or anything. Stuff is bad, right? This idea that, like, it's going to be okay. You know, there's enough out there. Because that's the other thing, too. It's all, sun it's all good when it's sunshine and rainbows that feel like, oh, we have this abundant mindset. But the real test comes when that cash crunch happens. You know, when that COVID hits, right? And revenue starts shrinking. And guess what? You still hire other contractors and you still throw them some stuff instead of just trying to, there's only enough for us. You know, you only pay yourself and not anybody else. That's what I'm talking about. What else we got? Come on, step into the hot seat. Let's go. Let's solve real business problems right here, right now. Go ahead. Let's go, Christina. I don't know if I have like, well, I do have a business problem. It is a business problem. Um, but I'm at the, I've done the validating. I've even done the sales, right? But I um, grew a brand with dog tag. I just graduated. And, um, and I have been working. So I'm a, I'm a professional coach as well. Um, and I have, a few niches they don't all like connect but they all are similar so one of those niches is families with teens or young kids um somehow I managed to get professional athletes I don't know how but you know one athlete killed another and then now I have like a niche of professional athletes and military you know relationships is basically my three niches and I created three separate I created a overall brand called Me Mastery. It's when you master yourself, you master your life, and um, and three niches with uh, within that brand. Um, but what I'm working as is just like I'm not really well known. I'm I haven't gotten to the marketing part. A lot of my sales comes from referrals, and so I'm. 
putting myself out there as Christine Cazone, like Christine Cazone coaching, like not really into my brand yet. And I'm in the process of, you know, starting to build my website and starting to build what my marketing would look like. And I guess my question is long-winded is, do I kind of like scratch everything and start from what I know in terms of like, like you said, build to the customers I have? Or, or do I just go with my name, like Christine Kazone Coaching, because everybody knows me there and like forget me mastery and just, and like let that go. Like, I don't know how to, I don't, I'm not feeling connected to my brand. I like the me mastery. Um, it would, because that's kind of like how I grew myself. Like the reason why I became a coach was because I learned to master myself. Um, this is a great question. I appreciate yeah. you. Bringing up. <laughs> and I'm a contrarian. So you don't have to listen to anything I'll say. Okay. Yeah. So you can get back. Take personal branding. This right here. This mm -hmm. is your personal brand. Ball it up and throw it away. Okay. People didn't connect with, you know what? I connected with you because the idea you said mastering yourself this idea of me mastering the mm -hmm. problem right now with personal brand everybody just want to talk about themselves they want it's me 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 make tiktok videos and da, da, da. you know you know what's a brand you know it's an idea black veteran entrepreneurs right that's an idea we need more black veteran entrepreneurs you know what i do i talk about that i wrote a book about it i share ideas about it you know what that's automatically going to get back to me you know what's another idea Kids need free amateur boxing, right? If a kid is in the inner city and they want to box, they should train for free, right? That's where I plant my frag. You know, we can build champions in and out of the ring, right? You know what that comes back to? Ironbound boxing. And if all roads lead to ironbound boxing, they also lead to Mike Stedman, right? You need an idea that you're known for, right? You already built this brand. You already have paying clients. Don't confuse people, okay. right? Me mastery is automatically associated with you. But I would keep pushing that. And that's for everyone here, right? Like all your businesses and all your stuff, right? Tim Ferriss wasn't anybody until he wrote the four-hour work week. He's known for the four-hour work week. That is an idea, right? That's what sparked people's interest. So again, this is my opinion, okay. right? Now, if you want to get out there and make TikTok videos and, you know, yeah. I got my laptop. Oh, I'm working at the coffee shop. Look, oh, you know, then by all means, be that professional coach. But I was on with Entrepreneur yesterday at one of my podcasts. Dude is uber successful, charging like $150,000 to $400,000 for uh, branding work. And you don't see this dude on nothing, right? He lets his work speak for itself. Now, what you can do in terms of building a reputation is you're getting all these referrals. Let's speed up the referral process. By now you have, it's called one killer outreach, right? So when someone is a referral of yours and you give them one thing that when they come across someone that says, yeah, man, I'm really, Hey, you should check this out. It can be a one pager. It can be an assessment. It can be something. Right. But that is how you're going to activate your network. Right. So you already got rep, you already got referrals coming in. Now let's throw jet fuel on it. Right. By giving them one killer outreach. Does that answer your question, Christina? It does. Thank you. He's like, I'm about to make a TikTok video right now. <laughs> Y'all won't believe what this guy just said to me. I want to do. Thank you. Yeah. Kenny, what about you? Kenny's got his hand up. Hey, Mike. Um, this is great to be here. Former Marine here. Uh, oh, Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> um, so, so I'm, I, I, uh, I love what you just said about the, the whole idea of personal branding. Um, so I am working on branding myself as a, as a, a one man production company, you know, a freelance of, of um, a freelance writer. And, um, my specialty is screenplays, you know, TV shows and movie scripts. Um, I've been, you know, in school for that for the past four years or so. So um, I'm working on my logo on my uh, my company name and my logo. So I, I I'm calling it Level Ken Productions, and it's a play on my name. But you know it's not, and I've pitched it to a few people and they like it, 
right? So it's like, it's not, a, I, I never really liked the idea of uh, using my whole name because I felt like it was too on, it's too on the nose. So, you know, but it's, it, it's a part of me, but it's not about me. It's about the stories of others. And I wanted to get your take on that because I've, I've kind of still, you know, even though I kind of like it myself, I've still kind of wrestled with it a little bit. Where are you based out of? Uh, D.C. All right, you're in D.C. Where do your, all your clients tend to come from? Well, um, right now, um, people are look. There's a there's a new there's a lot of new people getting into like in, independent film in the D.C. metro area, and uh, most and a lot of them are in Atlanta as well. So that's, you know, so I would be, I would, I would, I, you know, as a projection, I would probably be working from people working for and with people in those areas. I'm working with a couple of teams right now. One of them is based here and the other, the other team, you know, we're kind of spread out. One of them is in uh, Virginia beach. All right. So this is why I asked this question. All right. Again, I'm a contrarian. So there's anything I say, we can, we can, we can, we can step outside later. All right. What right. I try to tell people, though, is for small business, right, we want clarity as best as possible. Now, what you're going to have to decide, though, is do you want to be a freelancer? And there's nothing wrong with being a glorified freelancer. You can make good money. Or do you want to build a business, right? If you want to build a business, this brand needs to be able to operate without you, okay? And so something as simple as naming it can set conditions for that, right? Because then they'd be like, oh, you're not the same. I want Ken, right? So there's that. Now, any y'all ever go to those pop-up marketplaces, right? You know, they got the little pop-up, they got the vendor, they got their, you know, coconut oil or their little trinkets, whatever. And then you look at their name and it has nothing to do with that product. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like you're looking at a name and you're like, what do you, you know, what do you do here? Right. And I'm a proponent for small businesses, especially micro businesses that tend to be under like a hundred thousand or 200,000 a year. Yo, brand your business around, like make it easy for people to understand what it is you do, right? So like my company is called Ironbound Media, right? You might, now media can mean a lot, obviously, right? But you probably have an assumption. Once you see I do podcasts and do video stuff, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Or, you know, the reason I was asking you about um, where you're based is my girlfriend lives in Harlem, right? And there's a thing within, um, uh, or, you know, I, was, I had the guy on yesterday. If you want to charge premium, for your, your design stuff, just put Brooklyn on there. Just tell people you're based in Brooklyn, right? He started laughing. Um, but there's certain things that you can do with a brand from a name and location that gives it, you know, you can borrow brand. You know, you can borrow brand from others, right? Like you go to Harlem, everything is Harlem Biscuit Co., Harlem Brewery, Harlem Tavern, right? Because it gives them a swag. It gives them some, some pedigree with that only own. You start rolling out Kenny so-and-so, right? Where are we borrowing brand from, right? Now, the reason I asked about DC, maybe there's something you could do with, you know, Georgetown Studios or da-da-da or da-da-da, right? So when people see it, they get it, and they're like, oh, hell yeah, take my money. So that's just my thought, right? Like, how can we go for clear? You already said the term studios, right? But where else can you potentially borrow brand some, borrow some branding, and massage it? That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, that, and I've, I've seen that because I look at uh, other, um, I look at New York brands a lot because I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I like to call myself a New Yorker at heart. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I love that idea and um, I'm going to work on it some more. Thank you. Yeah, there's a brewery here in Newark called Newark Local Beer. It's the wackest brew I've ever seen, right? And it's struggling. Team struggle bus. Now you go to the Bronx Brewery, it looks like a Bronx Brewery. There's graffiti on the walls. They got the DJs going, taking my money. It boggles my mind when these businesses come in here and they try to, like, be this other, you know? We're like, no, man, if you're a local business, embrace that local community, that local flair, that local vibe, you know? Um, that's just my personal opinion. But, yeah. John, what's the word? John's on mute. What is your opinion on uh, using like my last name for my business? What's your business? Uh, well, 
this one right here is fishing for recovery. I'm trying to open a nonprofit, but I was just curious about like, cause my last business was a, uh, uh, DP air swamp tours, just basically using my last name to brand yeah. my service. I said, I'll say the same thing. I said to him, if you want this thing to operate independently of you, right. You need to be very intentional from the very beginning. And you also got to say, okay, your DPR is swamp tours, right? There's so many. I'm, I mean, I'm not a fan of branding your business, your, your name, right? Unless I'm like some advisory firm, I'm like Stedman and co or something like that. Right. Maybe that sticks around, but there's so much fun you can do with Brandon, right? Like, like it goes back to the dog whistle. Remember what I said about dog whistle, Brandon, right? Their ears perk up, right? What is terms that like only fly fishermen and swamp people know, you know, like what is kits and things like there's so much you can play on, right? I'm going to show you something. Um, my man, Dave, I'm gonna pick on you. I got this sucker right here when I was in Georgia, right? Y'all see this? All right. Does anybody know what this is? It holds your book open. It holds your book open. How'd you know that? <laughs> right? I don't know. I've just seen them. <laughs> but you're right. It holds my book open like this. So you're like reading, whatever. I pulled it out at a bookstore. Somebody was like, I'll give you a hundred dollars for it right now. I'm seriously, I pulled it out, whatever. Why do I say that, right? So I'm a big book. I love these independent bookstores, right? But Dave, if I'm wrong, there's kind of lingo that y'all already have in the bookstores, right? What's something that someone would say that is synonymous with an independent bookstore? Uh, local. Um, yeah. You're getting a, you're getting a more of an experience than browsing. You know, it's, it's community centered, community driven. Yeah. Something like this, right? People could look at this and they could also say, I have no idea what this is. Or these pins I got. Or those pins. So if I brand this sucker, what could I call it? Read with ease or something. You get what I'm saying? Right? So now it's, it's suggestive of like, oh, it's involved with reading in something. For you, DPR, right? That could work. Here's where you get bonus points for me. You actually have the Swamp Tour name. So, like, I don't have to guess what it is you do. So I can be like, oh, DPR, Swamp Tours. But you can also play around. You know, DPR kind of lazy, I would say, though. Like, what else can we do? Like, where can we have some fun? You know? Well, that was, like, that was literally the first business name. And now uh, that one's closed down, and I'm looking to do a nonprofit side of that now. Yeah. And what but I will where... say is, for nonprofit, you definitely want it bigger than you. Yeah, right? because definitely. Because if if it's your name, whatever, no, you need to build a brand that's going to be a story. You know, think about like charity water. They were like a very massive nonprofit, raised a lot of money to get clean water to people. Right. Like that's a name. You know? Yeah. Thank you. hundred percent. Who else? My man with the backwards cap. Chai, Zach Ham. Got any questions? Uh, not specifically, no, uh, but I'm enjoying all the things you're talking about. What's keeping you up in your business currently, like right now, today? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to get funding. Uh, so my idea is to have a community and employee owned like beverage company. I started off as a community like coffee shop, but I'm scaling that down to a minimum viable product by focusing on going to like festivals, concerts and farmers markets working on that scale and then uh attracting investors by using that as like a main marketing tool uh to tell them about the main vision of having this community center so let me ask you this question do you have um okay community center whatever do you have a business already it's up and running the coffee shop no all right this is why i'm asking this i forgot to say this when i was doing y'all's presentation Entrepreneurship is hard. It's all hard. But there are certain markets that are notoriously hard and business models. You open a restaurant, notoriously hard. You open an independent bookstore, notoriously hard. It is what it is. You don't think so, Dave? It's easy? It depends on the market. Uh, if, if you're in Chicago, yeah, you got Printer's Row, you've got Pilsen yeah. in Rockford. It's... They haven't, you have, just have to offer something different than what yeah. everybody else is doing. If you're on a Marine base, because Marines don't read, notoriously hard, right? 
Uh, but he's right, though. There are certain markets like where people super soon. Agency, uh, semi hard, right? Feast or famine. Venture backable startups, really, really hard. Now, why do I say this? Investors know this, you know? CPG, hard. And you start talking about coffee, there's a bazillion coffee brands out there, like currently, right? And branding isn't enough to differentiate your coffee, unless you're someone like Fire Department Coffee, where he sells to firefighters and first responders. So he can brand the hell out of that, right? Um, Vince, make sure you get my book, Black Veteran Entrepreneur, before you hop right here. I'm going to do this plug now for around time. Y'all check out my book, Black Veteran Entrepreneur, on Amazon, Violate Your Business Model, Build Your Brand. And guess what? You don't have to be a black veteran entrepreneur to get value out of this book, right? All of you will get value out of this book, I promise. Okay, there's my plug for the day. Thank um, you, go. Keep going. Appreciate it. So investors know this. So you got to be aware of that and say, okay, if you are trying to raise capital around something like coffee, where is the innovation? Innovation ain't going to be on brand. Is it the type of coffee? Is it some organic coffee or Chilean coffee or, you know, whatever? Right. Like think through that um, and test, too. And then yeah. also, if you are targeting investors, make sure you're targeting investors that focus on CPG. Right. Again, because they got that experience. But the other thing, too, is they're probably going to need some validation. And there's a lot of non-dilutive capital opportunities out there. Grants, pitch competitions, et cetera. Bunker Last put on a great blog that lists out like pretty much all of them in 2023. So check that out. Definitely. I will. So my, like my unique value proposition is that it's community and employee owned um, because we've had like, uh, like Starbucks, the one here, uh, like in the neighborhood next door, they unionized and then Starbucks shut down the, the location. So it's like, there are, uh, you know, it's, it's about creating a pillar of the community, not necessarily like coming up with a, a new way of serving coffee, you know? So let me ask you this. Is it being employee owned? Is that a feature or a benefit? Both. You think both? All right. Yeah. Recession. All right. Let's think about the buyer, right? That's buying coffee, right? You know what I care about? <laughs> Convenience of the coffee, right? How quick it's being served. It's a benefit. How much it costs. If it's in my neighborhood, now those are all added bonuses, right? Those are added bonuses, but there's certain things I care about, right? I can care about serving black owned businesses. If I'm in there waiting an hour and a half for my coffee or whatever, I ain't, you know, it is what it is, right? Why are you laughing tomorrow? You shouldn't be laughing. Um, so what I just be cautious of that. That's what I'm trying to say. Like yeah. if I was an investor and you pitch me and you say it's employee owned, that's a feature. That's like the guy with the app. It does this, it does this, it does this, it does this, you know? Um, and I think you need to lead with some other innovation, either around business model in terms of how the coffee is delivered, type of coffee, the positioning, um, et cetera. Yeah, I'll take that all into account. Thank you. We got less than eight minutes. Anybody want to jump on the hot seat? Going once. Twice, Constant Harris, we haven't seen you. Any questions? I know y'all used to people that come on here and just like to hear themselves talk. That ain't me. I'm going to pick on you. I'm going to pull you out. Let's go. I don't know if I have any questions. I don't know if I really want to be in the hot seat. <laughs> what's, keeping you up night, what's keeping you up at night currently in your business? Uh, well, I took a lot of value when you were explaining the personal brand also because that's where I struggled I struggled trying not to put myself in the brand but I also gravitate to brands that I see an actual person so that's two different things though mm -hmm. I didn't say don't be in it what I said is don't be in it talking about yourself right if you're out there championing an idea champion the hell out of that idea you know, if you believe in equal rights, champion equal rights. You know, if you believe that, um, I don't know, these more kids need to read, right? Then that's what you're talking about. You're sharing research on it. You're sharing your own thoughts. You're doing all this other stuff. That is automatically going to be associated with you. The problem with personal branding is people, it's gone off the cliff, 
right? People think it's about them. It's never about them. It's about the idea that they're sharing, right? Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan because of basketball, right? Without basketball, there is no Michael Jordan, right? So if he wasn't on the floor dunking and shooting the jumpers and doing all that other stuff, right, then we would not know who he is. That's what he's known for. So that's all I'm saying. If there's an idea that you're extremely passionate about, let's think of the Wright brothers, right? They wanted to fly an airplane, right? That's what they did was the airplane. They talked about the airplane. So if I'm the Wright brothers and I was on social media today, I might share about what I'm learning. You know, oh, we did this wrong. Or we did that wrong. Or, you know, da, da, da. We didn't account for this. Oh, I see reports coming out about this. Congratulations to so-and-so who flew a little bit longer than us, right? Like you need to be in the sphere that you operate in. You know, just be an authority. That's what you're going for. You're not going for branding. You're going for authority. Two different things, right? People are like, oh, I want a personal, you know, I want to, I want to be a thought leader. How about you write a hundred articles? Yeah. How about that? Or record a hundred podcasts. See, nobody wants to do the actual work, right? When you do the work, right? The result will come. Okay. I get that. Thank cool. you. Anyone else We've got less than five? Okay, I'll go. So I'm thinking about starting a podcast to like lead people into my business. Um, and so I want to know how you identified like your channel partners to add for your value add um, and how you identify those partnerships to, to work with. And did you start your podcast first before yes. you started to lead people to your business? So. Uh, I started my podcast in 2020. My first podcast was called Confessions of a Native Son, a Black Veterans Perspective on Race, Culture, and Business. And when the pandemic hit, I realized like, hey, I could probably monetize this, but I didn't want to monetize it off of ads because that's a rat race, right? That's just, I'm not letting other people tell me how valuable my content is. What I did was I monetized it off of production. So I said, hey, I did this over here. I could probably do it for you, right? And so just like people build websites, I build podcasts. That's what I do. Now, channel partners, though, I do have clients that literally pay us to host the show for them, right, and help them. So it's alignment. So it goes back to brand values, right? I've been getting hit up a lot by uh, entrepreneurial organizations, CDFIs, all these different groups that are targeting more black entrepreneurs, right? They want to reach more diverse audience, okay? And so when they come to me, my recommendation is let's create some kind of content, right? So they're less along downloads and things are good. But right now, whatever they're doing ain't working, right? So they're coming to you for this. Now, for you as a small business owner, what's your business? Um, I haven't started yet. I'm still a fellow, but it is in women's health and wellness. So women's health and wellness. Mm -hmm. What I don't want you to get in the trap of podcasting is podcasting for revenue purposes should be supporting effort number one or two, right? Supporting effort number one, main, the main effort is sales. Right. So this goes back to all of you, too. You're like, I want people to know what I'm what I want to get my get myself out there. This is you actually calling people, you know, hey, letting them know, you know, hey, uh, hey, Sarah, just want to let you know uh, I'm doing a lot more work to reach more black and brown entrepreneurs. Right. Um, da, 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 this is what we do. If you know anybody or you come across, boom, you do that like 10 times a day. Right. So that's actually calling people, letting them know, sending them a personal email, a thoughtful email, yada, yada, yada. So that would be main effort. And then supporting effort is once they start coming in your ecosystem, maybe they listen to your podcast to get more time with you. And like, oh, you know what? I like the way she thinks. Or maybe they read your newsletter. I like the way they think. So that's where content comes in. I think content needs to be supporting effort for sales. It should make sales easier because the goal is to get a better prospect. So by the time someone reaches out to me and says, hey, can you do this? They're already sold because they've already engaged with my content. So I'm not having to... Uh, you know, I don't know what the word I'm saying is like, I don't have to demonstrate my value. They already know it. And so they're coming in ready to go. Okay. Right. That's what I was thinking. Cause it's just like, if I do retreats, who's going to come to my retreat if they don't even know who I am. So, yeah. you know, that's what the podcast was for just to lead people there. Appreciate it. So I'm glad that helped and make sure all y'all add me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. I'm iron Mike Stepman on LinkedIn. The other thing I'll tell you is this was just a taste of like what's in here. I have a whole chapter dedicated to the five stages of small business growth, your marketing plan, how to get your first 10 cuts. I wrote this book for y'all because I, I noticed a gap when you're starting a business and you don't got VC and you feel like an underdog. You know, this is your book, right? 
Dave's got to let me know how I got to get in his bookstore, but I'm sure he's going to hit me. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to work something out. Um, but seriously, though, a lot of frameworks, and I keep a lot of resources in here, too. Um, so at the end of each chapter, I say how this applies to you, and then I have the additional resources of books and podcast interviews I've done. So you're not alone. So um, I know you all are in the alumni, right? It's, it's very challenging out there, but you got a great ecosystem here with everything they're doing at Dog Tag, myself. I have a podcast, too, The Transition, which is on iTunes or at Spotify. You can check that out. Great episode on five stages of small business growth on there as well. Um, but yeah, you know, if uh, you got value out of today, I would love you to uh, let us know by in the chat rating today's workshop with between one being it sucked and 10 being like, I got real value out of it. It was awesome. And if you, you know, if you do buy the book, make sure you leave us a review on Amazon. It's super helpful. I just want to jump in real quick. Mike, appreciate you. Love the energy. You're a real one. You got me fired up over over here, a ways a ways even through the computer. Thank you for your time and the message, brother. Everyone, take you. Mike, Vince, I got number love for y'all. For all the other randos I don't don't know, congratulations. Got love for you too, but it's partial to you know my cohort. But everyone, take care. Thanks, Obi, um, and thank you so much, Mike, for being here. I really appreciate it. This has been a wonderful session. I could not have asked for a better person to come and host an alumni learning lab. Um, and also, I'm glad that the Chicago fellows got the chance to hop on for this too. Um, and I see tens, tens, tens across the board in the chat, so <laughs> that's great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording now.